All right. Well, this morning, as I've said, we're going to dive into a subject that, um, let me just say this at the outset, that when you deal with something like this, that something that is really important, I mean, everything the Bible says is important, but it seems like whenever we focus on the gospel or we focus on spiritual warfare, it, it does seem as though attendance is lighter. It just maybe it's my imagination. But, but that's the way it seems, and, and it could be because the enemy is at work to try to prevent us from gaining insight into how he works. Well, if that's the case, it's going to be pretty light over the next several weeks because we have a lot to look at, okay? And let me just say in, in advance, uh, I am going to be drawing heavily on, on different Puritans. You know, it is interesting that we don't read a great deal today about the enemy, but there were experts on his operations, the way he functions, his tactics in uh, Puritan uh, England and New England, and obviously Martin Luther had a great understanding of, of his works as well. I think um, you probably remember the story. I think actually uh, Dick and Lita got to see, did you see the stain on the wall in the castle, the Wartburg castle, uh, where he threw the inkwell at Satan? Okay. Was Luther imagining things when he when he did that, that Satan was really in the room with him? Or do you think that maybe Satan was trying to stop Luther from getting the gospel out and trying to bring him down? You know, well, he, you know, I mean, the Bible says he's a real being and he's really at work and we need to be aware of him. Now, this verse that I'm going to read as our text this morning is really uh, the passage that Thomas Brooks uses to open up the subject in his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And I am going to draw from that book as we go through but not today. I think today, primarily, I'm going to be drawing from my favorite author. Uh, who, who might that be? Okay, Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards. Okay. And why do I like Jonathan Edwards? Uh, because the guy was brilliant. And he was not only a genius, but he was a sanctified genius. He loved the Lord, and his life was fully committed. It was said of Jonathan Edwards that if he had taken his intellectual powers and applied them to any field of learning, he would, have, he would have excelled. He would have been one of the greatest. And one of the things that, that liberals and people who don't believe the Bible is true, they, when they look at what Edwards did with his life, they think he basically wasted it because he spent it on the Bible. But we would look at that and say, you know, thank the Lord that he spent it on the Bible because of the things that he was able to see and teach the church. So anyway, I'm going to draw from Edwards. That's why I like Edwards. He has a lot of insight. And by the way, if you like Gerstner, if you like Sproul, that's the influence that really moved them in, in that particular direction. Uh, so they also were drinking from the same uh, fountain, so to speak, from the same well, or the same, as, as Gerstner would say, the, the same cup that Edwards was using to dip into the infinite knowledge of God. And, you know, he had his little cup <laughs> and then, you know, Gerstner stands underneath, uh, uh, underneath Edwards with his, what he calls his demi tasp spoon, trying to catch some of the drippings from his cup. You know, no one can exhaust the infinite knowledge of God, but there are people who have more of it than we do, so we try to learn from it. Okay. Well, let me read the text. The text is 2 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11. Paul writes, But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, I might say more about this later on, not, not today, but just understanding the context, I, I think commentators are mostly agree that Paul here is referring to, um, you know, the man in 1 Corinthians 5 that was committing incest. He had his father's wife. Don't know whether the father was still living or not, but it was inappropriate, obviously, sin for him to have his father's wife. He was to be put out of the church, but it appears now he's come to repentance. And Paul is saying you should bring him back in and welcome him and forgive him, okay? But if you don't, realize that one of the schemes that Satan tries to ensnare us by is having an unforgiving heart and not welcoming people back. And he says, you know, we need, to be, we need to be aware that Satan is at work. He's trying to take advantage of us. He's trying to destroy us. You need to know that. And he even points out the fact that we know how he works. You know, we're not ignorant of his schemes. 
So what I want us to see from this is really everything we're going to look at in this series, um, that, that Satan is trying to take advantage of us. He's trying to destroy us. And that we shouldn't be ignorant of the way he works. You know, if we want to repel the enemy, we have to recognize him when he comes. So we're going to really focus just on that first part this morning. We need to know our enemy today, that he exists, and to know that he hates us and wants to destroy us. Well, again, how does this connect with what we were looking at before? Well, you know, we spent a number of weeks looking at why we should love God, and that's because of his infinite and eternal love towards us. You know, there's lots of reasons there we should love him. And then we looked at how we are to love God, and of course, we looked at Jesus' perfect example of how he kept the perfect law of love, okay? But then last week, we began to consider this, that even if we did manage to keep the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and we, but we only did it outwardly, just going through the motions. We need to realize that that's not what God's after. Although He'd rather we do the motions than not do them, there's something more that needs to be there, and that is affection, affection for God. Remember what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13.3, we saw last week, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. If I, if I give up all my wealth, all, all that I have to live on, and give up my life, you know, those are great sacrifices, the greatest that anyone can make. But if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. You know, I, I couldn't, I, <laughs> Donna's probably going to laugh at this, but I couldn't help but think about a popular Christian artist from the 70s, one of my, my favorite uh, uh, because he would sing songs that, that were based on the Bible, okay? And he had a song about our duty to love our spouses, even when we don't feel like it. And in it, he wrote this, uh, this line, Love is not a feeling. It's an act of your will. Perhaps you recognize that uh, line as well. Well, he's wrong, okay? It's not just an act of the will. Love is a feeling. Okay, it's an affection, it's a disposition of the heart. Now, what he was trying to say was, even if you don't feel love towards your wife, you still need to love her. You need to go through the right motions, and, and that's true. But we need to realize there is more to it than just that. We need to love our spouses. We need to love God. There needs to be affection in our hearts. If our hearts are not in our obedience, then it's not acceptable to God. Okay, it's not acceptable. It has to be a love for Him and desire for His glory. And if we're going just through the motions, we saw last week that there, you know, John Gerstner had a term for that. He called that a bad good work. It's a good work outwardly, formally, you're going through the right motions, but it's bad in the fact that your heart is not in it. You're not, you don't have the right motives. And so we went on to explore how we can strengthen that love in our hearts. And Really, I was tying it to that axiom, and you would have to agree, and I think you'd have to agree either way, even if you don't accept this, the axiom th about good and evil. You know, what is good? What is evil? Well, good is the presence of God. Evil is the absence of God. Remember, like light and darkness and, and cold and, and heat, okay? And if we understand that relationship then really the answer is simple as to how we are to strengthen our love and affection for God. If we would love Him more, we need Him to draw near to us. We need His presence. But in order for that to take place, we have to draw near to Him. Remember, that's what James tells us. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. That's the reason why God gave us the Holy Spirit, was to turn us around from going away from Him and to begin pursuing Him. And that's also why he gave us the means of grace, why he gave us the ways by which we can approach him. Uh, this is one of them, what we're doing this morning, where we exercise all of them, essentially. We get into his word, and we read his word, and we, we meditate on it, you know, we, we explain it, and we apply it. Uh, we need to do that at home as well. You know, reading the Bible, we need to be praying, seeking the Lord for his spirit and his presence, again, drawing near to him through the word and prayer. We need to make sure we obey his commandments because when we disobey his commandments, when we sin, then we're drawing away from God 
And he's drawing away from us. We know how sin quenches the Spirit because it grieves the Holy Spirit. But I think one of the most important things is the Sabbath because on the, the Sabbath is that time that God gives us in order to immerse ourselves in all these different ways to, to seek Him. And, you know, I, I'll just mention this again. I forget whether I mentioned it last time we talked about the Sabbath, but I, I look at the Sabbath as a spiritual thermometer, and it gives to us sort of a reading on our spiritual health. And if we look at the Lord's Day, and we, you know, which is the Christian Sabbath, and we say, you know, I really don't want to go to church. I really don't want to spend a day with God. You know, I really want to do these other things. You know, I want to watch this on television. I want to go to the sporting event. I want to go to the beach. You know, I want to do all these things. What does that tell us about where God ranks in our hearts, in, in our priorities? You know, how do we really feel about God? And think about this. Sabbath is really a picture of heaven and what we're going to be doing forever in heaven, which is worshiping the Lord in His presence. And and we say, oh, I, I, I love heaven and I want to be in heaven and I, you know, I, I, that's what I'm aspiring to. But then we have this day which is like heaven and we say, well, I really don't want to do that. Okay, so that's what I say. The Sabbath really shows us where we're at. But he's given us the Sabbath to draw near to him through all these different ways so that, you know, that he might draw near to us and that our love for him would be strengthened and again, as I mentioned last week, well, I'll mention it here in the conclusion of this point, at any one moment in our lives, at any moment, we're doing one of two things. We're either moving away from God or we're drawing towards God. And if we want our love to grow, we need to be moving towards Him. Okay? How is it that these great saints of old were able to do so much for God's glory and honor? It's because they were seeking Him drawing near to him, and they were filled with his presence. Okay, but that, I said, was the conclusion of that. But, but here's another new area that we need to explore. If we would grow in this love, because we need to realize that there is someone who is working against us, okay, an enemy that the Lord clearly warns us against in his word, who's trying to get us to go the other way, to draw away from God. So this morning, I want us again to remember, first of all, that he exists and that he is a very real threat. So again, we want to consider the origin of the enemy and why it is he hates us so much. Okay, you know who our enemy is. We've already talked about him from these other passages. And we know that he's known by various names in Scripture. Okay? In our passage, Paul calls him Satan. And I know we often use the word Satan. We understand that refers to the devil. But that word actually explains something about him. The word Satan means adversary. And he's called our adversary because he hates us, because he's our enemy. Now, he's also called the devil, and that tells us a little bit more about his mode of operation. Devil means slanderer. He is the one who accuses us before God. We read in Revelation 12.10 this, that I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. You know, just, just think about Job. Remember when the sons of God appear before God in heaven and Satan appears and he appears in order to accuse Job. You see, that, that's what he does. And, and there are false accusations. That's where the slander comes in. Uh, so he is attacking us typically in this way. And another way, of course, the, perhaps the most important thing we need to bear in mind is when he attacks, that's how he attacks us before God. But how he attacks us personally is through deceit. Now, Jesus, in the Lord's Prayer, calls him the evil one, and that's really the last thing that I wanted us to see about his names, because that is his nature. And we want to try to come to understand why he has this nature. So, who is the enemy? Who is Satan? Who is the devil? How did he get this way? And we're going to look a little bit at what we call angelology, okay? 
Well, as I've said, understanding his origin will give us some insight into you know, why he is the way he is, why he hates us, why he wants to destroy us. Well, we know Satan is a fallen angel. Now, who are the angels? Okay, I want to do just a brief diversion here just to talk about them because we don't think about them either, you know. The angels also exist. The angels are also active. The angels are protecting us from Satan and his demons, okay? So we need to be aware of them as well. Well, before God made Adam and Eve, he made other creatures in his image, uh, really a whole order of them, uh, spiritual beings that don't have a physical body, and they're called, of course, angels. And, you know, it's, it's been argued, when did he make them? You know, when did God make the angels? And um, some say, well, they were a part of a creation before this creation. God kind of lived eternally with the angels in heaven. That isn't true. During the creation week, God made everything. You know, before, it, before the creation week, there was just God. You know, the triune God in eternity, no time, and no place. You know, he's, he's everywhere. What, however we conceive of that, it's, it's difficult because he is God. But heaven did not exist, and the angels did not exist. Only God exists. He's the only one who's eternal. So it's likely that God made the angels on the very first day when Moses writes, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, my Old Testament prof had a pretty good argument that heavens in Genesis 1.1 is really referring to the heavens in which God dwells with the angels, the place where we would go, our souls would go when we die and go through the intermediate state, uh, where the souls of the righteous are right now and, and they're worshiping God in heaven. Uh, that he, that's what that's referring to. That would be the creation of the angels and the creation of heaven. And there, his reasoning behind it was this, because Moses then goes on to talk about the earth, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void. And, and then he goes on to explain how over the six days, all of that is arranged and orders brought to it. But think about what takes place during those six days. And that is God creates the stars and, and the celestial heavens. And, and this Old Testament prof said that is a part of the of the world in which he's making. But in, in Genesis 1-1, the heavens he's referring to are the creation of the angels. Now, the question is, why did God make them at the time in which he did make them? Well, I think we have to surmise that he made them so that they could witness his work of creation. Okay? He wanted them you might say an audience, or an audience just talks about people who hear you. He wanted a, a group to see okay, his power and his wisdom so that they might praise him and glorify him. You know, God doesn't do what he does in a vacuum. He does everything he does for a reason. Now, that makes sense out of what God says to Job at the end of his trial. In Job 38, verses 4 through 7, he asks him this question. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Notice, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So where were you, Job, when I was creating the earth? When all the angels were shouting joyfully because of everything that the Lord was doing. They obviously had to be created before that so that they could witness it. Now remember, God does everything that he does to reveal his glory. That's why he made the world and the universe. That's why he made us, um, so that we might glorify him by seeing what he has made and giving him honor. So it would make perfect sense that he would create the angels before these creative acts to create the, the physical world so that they could see it and give him glory. Now, that's one of the reasons why God made the angels, but he made them for other reasons as well. Uh, we see in Scripture that angels are the guardians of God's presence and his holiness. Remember when the Lord reveals himself in heaven, just think about uh, Isaiah 6 and that, that uh, heavenly council chamber we read about the angels, the seraphim, who surround God, 
and guard his holiness and who are worshiping him. Okay? That's what's depicted when you read about the temple or the tabernacle and you read about the uh, Ark of the Covenant, how on the, the top of the covenant on the lid or the ark was the mercy seat, which is a, a picture of the throne of God in heaven. And then what's, what's next to the, the mercy seat but these uh, angels, seraphim, who have their wings stretching over the mercy seat. Perhaps you've seen a depiction of it, <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark or whatever, but you've seen pictures drawn of it. But they're covering the mercy seat to protect the holiness of God. Okay? They're the guardians of His holiness. After the fall, the Lord stationed the cherubim, which is you know, essentially like seraphim. A seraph is singular, seraphim is plural, cherub is singular, cherubim are plural, so he stationed several cherubs to guard the garden, the Garden of Eden, which was his sanctuary, so that Adam and Eve, who had fallen into sin and in this unholy state, could not return into the garden in order to pollute the garden. Okay? Actually, he, he put those angels there for two reasons, to guard the holiness of God. Nothing unholy could enter his presence, but also he put them there to keep them from entering so that, as we read in, in Genesis 3 and the fall, that they could not come back into the garden and go to the tree of life because life, eternal life, could, never, could, could no longer be obtained in that way. Now, remember that the tree of the knowledge, or the tree of life, I should say, was not a magic tree that contained eternal life, and if you just ate a piece of its fruit, you would have eternal life. It was really a symbol, like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a symbol of what Adam and Eve would receive if they had passed their probation, if they hadn't listened to the enemy, but repelled him as, as you know, again, as guardians of the sanctuary of God, which they were as well. If they had done that, it was a symbol of the eternal life they would have received. They would have been confirmed in life forever. But now they couldn't have life that way because they had sinned. Now life had to come another way, so they were kept from going back into the garden. Now they had to trust in the one that God was going to send. Remember the promise, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. If they trusted or believed the promise of God that he was going to send the deliverer into the world who would destroy the works of the devil, then they would be saved. And as a matter of fact, Adam and Eve were saved, and everyone who has ever been saved is saved in that exact way, trusting in the Lord. So they guard God's holiness. But the angels also serve us, okay? They serve God's elect people. Remember what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? You know, the author to the Hebrews is contrasting Christ with the mediators of the Old Covenant, of which were the angels, and Jesus is the one that the angels worship. Uh, the, the elect are the ones that God gives to Jesus for his work. Well, who are the angels? Well, they're ministering spirits. They, they serve those who inherit salvation. Christ is much greater, but this is one of the things that the angels do. They minister to us. They do that in a couple of ways. They bring messages from God. You know, the word angel means messenger, one who is sent. And we know the Lord dispatched Gabriel on one occasion with a message for Daniel uh, about the 70 weeks. Remember, the 70 years of exile were over. Daniel realized that. He sought the Lord. What's next, Lord? The Lord sends Gabriel, and he says there's 70 weeks of years that have to do with the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and then the coming of the Messiah. And then Gabriel was dispatched, we know. Um, what would you say? Uh, I don't know exactly where that falls in the weeks, but to bring word to Mary, okay, that she was going to conceive and, and bear this, this Savior, this Messiah, and then to Joseph to tell him that this child was of the Holy Spirit and that Mary had not been unfaithful to him. So angels are messengers who bring God's message to his people. And notice in, in particular, these messages all had to do with the coming of the Messiah and that great work of redemption. Well, the angels also protect us. You know, think about Jacob on his way to Paddan Aram, and he has this vision of the angels ascending and descending on that ladder from heaven. 
and he makes it safely to Paddan Aram, and then when he's coming back into the Promised Land, and of course he's afraid that uh, Esau is going to um, kill him, he meets along the way um, the camp of the angels. The angels are camped out, and again, the Lord is reminding him that I have my, my guardians, my protectors. They're watching over you, and I'm not going to let Esau hurt you. Well, the, the Lord has his angels watching over us, you know, and, and they protect us. Usually, we're unaware, you know, of, of their involvement, but who knows exactly what they're doing. You know, I have my own personal story where I think it looks to me like maybe an angel was involved, and not because of anyone special, but God had infinite mercy on me. But when I was driving that truck years ago and going up the freeway at, you know, in the fast lane and going as fast as the truck would go, I think it was about 60 or 65, and uh, noticing all these weird things going on, uh, you know, that didn't make any sense and some new noises and tickings and smells. And, and then suddenly this, the front wheel of the truck just goes right off, just falls off the front. And I see this thing go off to the side. I don't know what it is, but suddenly the truck is, is going out of control and, and I'm panicked. And then I see this, uh, this, other, this object come from the side and it hits the front of the truck and the truck props up like, you know, suddenly and I have control of the truck again and I pull over to the side and I get out and look and, and what, came, what happened was the, the tire and the wheel came right off the spindle and I went down on the brake pads, you know, just the front axle was a straight axle and I'm on the pads and, and have really no control and then the thing must have hit the guardrail, came back and went under the front of the truck and cradled the axle so that I was riding on the lug nuts and the outside of the wheel and I had control and some guy who saw what happened behind me, he just couldn't believe that that had happened. I mean, what are the odds? Was there angelic involvement? Well, unless there were some, you know, incredible circumstances, we know God and providence worked it out. But the angels also are protecting us and watching over us and keeping us safe. And then lastly, the angels have the task of bringing our souls to glory when we finally die. And we only have to think of how they carried Lazarus. Remember in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, how when he died, the angels conveyed his soul to heaven, which you know, was called Abraham's bosom. But you know, we, the, the, the Jews understood what that meant, and we understand what that means. As Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, which is in heaven. Now, some commentators believe that Jesus was describing an actual event in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus because it is the only parable that Jesus gives a name, a personal name. Some believed both characters, Dives and you know, uh, Lazarus, but at least to one of them. Why? It was because there was a real person named Lazarus who experienced these things. So when our time in this world is complete, the Lord will send his angels to carry our souls to heaven. I remember uh, going to a funeral where the pastor was talking about really embellishing this. You know, our brother passed away. The angels came and took him. And as they were lifted, as he was, you know, lifting him up into space, they passed by the moon and they passed by Saturn and Mars. And, you know, I, I don't know. But um, certainly, I'm, I'm not sure how long the journey takes. But our souls don't automatically spring to God. They need someone to take them there. And that was the angels, to carry us to heaven where we might enjoy God's glorious presence forever in the ultimate nearness of God, okay, where we experience the ultimate love for him. Now, the thing is, that is what Satan was created to be, okay? That was what he was created to do. He was one of these angels. He was originally made holy, one of God's greatest creations, but like Adam and Eve, he was changeably so. He fell away from God. Now, we read about that in Ezekiel 28. And even though the Lord addresses these statements to the king of Tyre, it's generally understood because of the things he says about him that he's really addressing the malignant spirit behind the king of Tyre, who is the devil. So listen to what he says here. And this, this is the, the positive stuff first, but can you imagine the king of Tyre experiencing this? Okay. All right, beginning in verse 12 in Ezekiel uh, chapter 28. Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, 
You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, and the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. Now, we'll just stop there for a moment and notice that Satan, he's talking about Satan. At the time he was an angel, some believe that his name may have been Lucifer. Some say, well, it's really not a name. It just means star of the morning or something like that. But whatever, okay, he was a cherub. He was perfect, wise, and beautiful. He was in Eden which was the sanctuary of God, on the holy mountain, which was at that time heaven. Remember, at the time of Adam and Eve in the garden, that is a time when heaven and earth were actually together. God's dwelling was among men. Adam and Eve literally had fellowship with God. They worshiped him on the Sabbath. You know, Adam and Eve, that's something they did. God gave them that day of rest to worship him. And they could actually do it with God present. You know, I mean, Visibly present, he made himself present, or at least uh, visible in, in some way. Just a wonderful situation. And by the way, this is important to understand. Heaven and earth were together, but when Adam sinned against God and failed the probation, was cast out of the garden, heaven and earth were separated. Now heaven is up. Heaven is above. Earth still beneath under the curse of the, of the you know, under the curse of sin, all that corruption, but we know one day it's going to be set free because of the work of the second Adam, because his work redeemed not only the elect, but his work also redeemed the creation. And we read in the book of Revelation that one day heaven and earth will again join together, the tabernacle of God will be among men, and God and and the Lamb will be the light of, of this new heavens and this new earth. Well, at that time, Satan was the anointed cherub who covers, one who protected the holiness of God, the sanctuary of God, as the cherubs who were stationed to guard the garden. He was blameless. He was perfect until he rebelled against God. And we read about that in verses 15 through 17 of Ezekiel 28. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. And I think perhaps there he's transitioning back to the king of Tyre. Now, think about this. Satan was perfect, like Adam and Eve, but at some point, he sinned. And the question is, why? Okay, why did he sin? Well, we know why Adam and Eve sinned. We explored that a little while ago. You know, they were under the temptation and didn't look to God for a greater grace to overcome the temptation, were deceived by the enemy. But what happened to Satan? Why, why was he deceived? You know, Or how did he fall into sin if his heart was, again, perfectly made or made perfect in love towards the Lord? Well, here I'll call upon my favorite theologian again, Jonathan Edwards. And by the way, I'll mention his name because I don't want to take credit for his thinking. You know, plagiarism is not a good thing, although every idea I have is plagiarized from someone. I don't remember where it comes from now. But these ideas come from Jonathan Edwards. He believed that the event that brought about the fall Satan's fall and the fall of the of the fallen angels was when the Lord revealed to his angels the purpose for which he had created them that they would be the ministers or the servants of those who would inherit salvation so this is what he believed was their probation their tree of the knowledge of good and evil would they submit to God Or would they rebel against him? That's exactly what Adam and Eve, the same choice they had to make. Would they submit to God, not eat of the tree? 
or would they rebel against him? Now, unlike man who was put on probation representatively through Adam in the garden, I mean, why was all of mankind put on probation through one man? It's because human beings procreate. And the whole human race had to be put on trial at one time. You couldn't have people being born in the garden and having falls as they're getting kicked out of the garden. It all had to be settled at once. But with the angels, you see, they all existed at the same time. And they could all be put on trial at the same time. And so they were. Now, the thought in Satan's mind that this greatest of cherubs, you know, made perfect in wisdom and beauty and splendor, superior in all these ways to these creatures, would stoop to serve these who were so far below him was more than he could really bear. And so he rebelled. Now, one thing we need to bear in mind is that, you know, this truth that the reason why God made the angels the way he did, superior in knowledge, superior in wisdom, superior in strength and power, is because he made them to serve. Servants are always going to be endowed with more than those that they serve. And that's the case in all the different spheres. We noticed uh, before that God places in creation. Why does the magistrate give an authority? Why are husbands given authority? Why are parents given authority? Or elders in the church? It is that they might serve those who are under their authority. I mean, look at the greatest example of all, the Lord Jesus Christ, endowed with the Spirit above measure, power and authority over all creation. Why did he have it? It was that he might become a servant to us in order to reconcile us to God. So that's why the Lord endowed these angels with this great power and all this glory and majesty. But Satan could not brook the idea of stooping to serve something so far below him. And he wasn't the only one, okay? A third of the angelic host followed him in this rebellion. Perhaps Satan deceived them or perhaps, again, they experienced the same thing he did. But remember, Satan was the greatest of God's creation. These angels are powerful, but they were less powerful. But we read in Revelation 12, verse 4, this image regarding the dragon, who is the devil. And this is what John sees in his vision. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And that's the reason why we believe a third of the angelic host fell with him. Now, why didn't all of them fall? Why were, the, were there those who were able to stand, but those who could not stand? Well, again, Jonathan Edwards surmises that God has his elect among the angels in the same way that he does among mankind. Paul speaks to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.21 of the chosen angels, where he says, I charge you before God and before Christ and before his chosen angels. Why are they called chosen angels? Well, Edwards believed they were chosen, just like mankind, uh, those among men who were chosen, uh, to, to stand. You know, in the case of man, they has to be recovered from his fall. But in the case of the angels, it was to keep them from falling. God gave the chosen angels, the elect angels, the power to stand. But to those who weren't chosen, he withheld that, that power, and they fell. Now, having rebelled against God... Satan and his angels, the Lord withdrew his Holy Spirit from them entirely. Remember, it's only God's presence in the heart that makes one good, that makes one love, and his absence makes one hate. So when he withdraws his Spirit from them, these angels, who were once holy, become purely evil. They lost all their goodness. They lost all their holiness. And instead of loving God, now they hated him and wanted to destroy him. But since they could not destroy him, they went after everything else that God had made. They went after his creation, particularly those who were made in his image. And that's the reason why we see Satan immediately sets out after the fall to bring about the fall of, after his fall, to bring about the fall of Adam and Eve. Because if he can bring down those who have charge over the creation, he can bring down the whole creation. And you see, since that time, Satan has been working and fighting against the Lord to try to destroy and overcome his work 
And that's the reason why Paul tells us in our passage, Satan is seeking an advantage against us in order to bring us down, in order to destroy us. Now, thankfully, and this will be my last point, okay, God restrains him. You know, we saw in the case of fallen man who lost the spirit, I mean, man is born without the spirit of God. Man is born guilty and sinful because he has lost all goodness, all of the moral likeness of God. Um, but he's not as evil as we might expect him to be. Remember, we, we saw that, I think, a couple weeks ago in the evening. If the Bible describes man in the condition he is, why does my neighbor seem like such a nice or friendly person, maybe even nicer than I am, you know? Well, it's because God restrains that sin. Same thing is true of the devil and his demons. God holds them back. You know, one thing else that Jonathan Edwards says is not too flattering for mankind he says the heart of fallen man and the heart of the devil, they're the same. There's no difference between them, okay? There's only pure hatred of God. That is with regard to their hearts. Why do they behave differently? Well, because God restrains the sin of fallen man more than he does of the devil, okay? But we have that same heart, and that's, of course, why we need redemption. But if we have redemption, we have the Spirit, and we're no longer in that condition. So God is holding the devil back. Like all of his creatures, the devil is under God's absolute control. And that's why we see Satan going to heaven as the sons of God appear before God to get permission in order to touch Job. Because, again, as Jonathan Edwards would say, the devil is on a chain. You know, and, and the Lord is the one who holds that chain. And he only lets him go so far and no further. And that's why Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer that the Father would not lead us into testing, but deliver us from the evil one. And think of it in these terms, you know, don't slacken that chain and let Satan come at me. But instead, deliver us from him and his influences. Now, we need to understand that there are circumstances under which God does slacken the chain. Otherwise, Satan could never touch us, right? He uses Satan as he does evil. Remember all the evil in the world? I mean, why did he let Joseph's brothers do everything he did to Joseph? It was so that he might deliver his people from the famine and let them grow in Egypt while the, the, those in the promised land were fulfilling the cup of his wrath, that he might bring them out and bring them into the promised land. There was a good purpose behind it. God uses all evil for good purposes, and he uses the evil one for his good purposes and his good purposes to make us more like Jesus. So as we consider in the future how the devil works, we need to remember that God is using him, you know, to help us essentially, but he will only allow him to go so far and no farther. And when he allows him to approach us, and by the way, when we're talking about Satan, we're just going to use him as an abbreviation. He's the one who's in charge of all the demons. It may not be the devil who's personally approaching us, but it could be one of his demons. We don't want really, we don't want either because of the, the, the mischief that they create, okay? Uh, he's only going to allow him to go so far. But when he does allow him to come, it's ultimately for our good. It's been said that um, a tree will only put down its roots, you know, deeply, if there's a wind that is blowing, you know, trees that are in areas where there's no wind and a sudden gust of wind comes, blows them over because they haven't put down deep roots. They, the deep roots develop because of the, of the stimulation of the wind against the tree. And in the same way, if we're to grow stronger, we need to have that pressure applied to us. And the way that the Lord does it is through this, this one particular mean. There's various other means, but certainly at this uh, through this means. At the same time, though, notice this, that God wants us to know how the devil works. So he's not, just, he's not just going to let the devil approach us and just have his way with us. He's going to warn us that the devil is going to approach us, and he's going to show us how he's going to come against us so that we'll be ready when he comes to not fall into his snare, but in order to resist him. And this is, again, another way that the Lord uses Satan to strengthen us. Now, does it sound to you like the Lord wants us to have just an easy and comfortable life here? He doesn't really. 
Because he knows the only way we're going to grow is through trial and adversity. That's the reason why we have to face it. So there's going to be a variety of ways in which he will allow that to come into our lives. But let's not forget his purpose behind it is good and it's loving. But, but note this in closing. To the extent that the devil succeeds in bringing us into sin, to that extent he will succeed in weakening our love. And how does the Lord use that for good? Well, we're going to see when we fall into it how it affects our relationship with the Lord. And it's going to make us more cautious, more on our guard so that we don't fall into it again. That's the reason, that's how the Lord uses it to strengthen us. But to the extent that Satan fails and we overcome him and we draw near to God instead, to that extent our love will grow. So just think of this enemy. He's trying to pull us away from God and God is warning us against him so that we'll escape his snare and we'll draw near to him. So in the upcoming weeks, we're going to consider some of his tactics. And, and by the way, he's got a lot of them so that we can recognize those attacks and we'll also look at how to repel him in each of these attacks. You know, how to use the armor of God, essentially. How to use the word of God to fight against him. So in closing, let me just simply say this. Satan and his demons are real. And they are interacting with you. And if you don't understand that, then he's already won. Okay? We, we need to believe what the word of God says. And we need to respond to this in faith. We need to see what we can't see. And we need to prepare ourselves or at least become aware of what's going on that we may not actually be aware of right now and get out of those snares so that we might draw near to God and that we might love Him more. Well, let's, uh, let's spend uh, just a moment in prayer as we uh, ask the Lord to apply that and also as we prepare to come to the table this morning.